welcome to the ninth CORE webinar. We are thrilled to have you join us as part of our Connected and Open Research Ethics Project. The goal of the webinar series is to provide an engaging ed educational opportunity for our 500 plus CORE network members to learn from each other. Today we welcome Dr. Danny Arrigo, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Rowan University. Danny earned her PhD in psychology from Syracuse University and completed a postdoc at Drexel University before taking a faculty position at the University of Scranton. Danny now leads the Clinical Health and Social Experiences Lab, also called CHASE, at the Rowan University and is in the first year of her NIH K award. Today, Danny will talk about her research to understand and harness social influences on health and health behaviors, including the ethical challenges associated with using digital health tools as an early career researcher. And please note, for those of you joining us today, please post questions in the comment box, and we will address those questions during the last 10 minutes of our session. So, Danny, thank you for joining us today. Take it away to be here. Thanks to everyone who signed in and anyone who looks at this later. Uh, so I'm Danny Arrigo. As Camille said, I am at, now at Rowan University in the Department of Psychology. So my PhD is in clinical psychology. I'm going to circle back to that in a bit. But I'm in a traditional medical setting where the research that I've done has evolved to focus more on digital health than I ever expected. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is the way that your career can advance in ways that you didn't necessarily expect and how other early career researchers might be a little bit more intentional than I was and maybe achieve some milestones earlier than I did. See, I have a long list of other roles that I play besides my faculty position at Rowan University. So I'm the co-chair of the Behavioral Informatics and Technology SIG for the Society of Behavioral Medicine. I'm a member of the Digital Health Council, and I run their joint Twitter account. Um, one of the things that, one of the reasons that I really wanted to be here with you today and do this webinar is that in addition to the experiences that I've had in my own career and uh, talking to people who are in the early career stage through the Society of Behavioral Medicine, and also I'm pretty active on Twitter. And one of my, we'll call them obsessions, is reading about other early careers researchers' concerns and struggles and ways that they have tried to address some of the things that they face. And this is across a range of disciplines. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are some thoughts that I've really been putting together about what some of the main concerns might be for an early career researcher in digital health with a specific emphasis on some of the ethical questions. So as a psychologist, and again, I'm a clinical psychologist, my emphasis is in health behavior change. So I specialize in social influences on health and health behavior change. I'll swing back to that in a little bit. But essentially, as As part of the behavioral medicine field, which is one component of the multidisciplinary field of behavioral medicine, my goal is really to understand and modify individual or small group behavior and focus on the principles that underlie health behavior change and really try to advance the science of health behavior change. So when someone wants to quit smoking or increase their physical activity, if they're coping with a chronic illness, how is it that we can use psychological principles to understand those processes and help people modify their behaviors to become more healthy and achieve their health goals? How do we do all this? Well, like a lot of fields, we would do some assessment, usually before and after behavior change efforts, sometimes during behavior change efforts to try to capture how things are changing and learn about that process, which we could then potentially apply to intervention programs and using face-to-face uh, -face discussion or websites or other tools that are designed really to incorporate all of these principles that we've learned about and adapt them to support a particular group of people in their behavior change efforts. So like all human subjects research, this comes with ethical concerns and challenges. Probably no surprise to anyone who's listening. But when we talk about using digital health tools, so something like a website, something like a mobile app, I'll talk a little bit about social media and smartphone applications, uh, wearable technology, we can increase the reach and effectiveness of this work uh, by being able to do a lot of it remotely using tools that people already have access to. But 
if you're here today, you know that these come with their own ethical concerns and challenges. So one of the things that uh, a group of us who are working together through the Society of Behavioral Medicine wanted to do was take a look at where the field with respect to using technology really broadly and think about where the field that we now consider digital health is going. So in a paper that's going to be coming out in the Journal of Behavioral Medicine later this year, uh, we took a look back at where we've been and where we'd like to go in this field. We created a timeline based on our lit review that looked at the use of pedometers and obesity treatments starting all the way uh, in the late 1940s um, through biofeedback methods, audio recording, chat rooms, text messaging, and all the way up to just-in-time adaptive interventions, which uh, really have enabled us to do continuous assessment and responsiveness to how people, how people's needs might change with respect to their health behavior change efforts. At the beginning of trying to quit smoking, you may need and want something very different to help support you than you would after you'd be, after you after you'd um, not had a cigarette for three years, for example. And learning how that process changes and the tool actually adapting to you involves a lot of people from a lot of different disciplines contributing expertise. And that's one thing that is we're moving into the digital health field, really being collaborative, multidisciplinary, and interdisciplinary, even more so than it's ever been. That, as I'll say, I'll come back to in a few minutes, can be really daunting for an early career researcher, especially when we're mixing in and trying to address the uh, unique ethical challenges that may be raised by some of this, uh, this new technology. So when we're using something like a, a smartphone to assess and intervene, we have a lot of different concerns that might come up. First of all, how do we explain to a potential participant, uh, if we're trying to get them interested in participating in a study, how might we explain what kinds of observations we're going to do without that changing the behavior that's being observed? So in psychology, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we explain this in a way that's transparent, in a way that is uh, completely honest and communicates risk? but also doesn't have a long-term effect on the behavior that we want to observe naturally. When we're doing something like a, an intervention via social media, so if we were going to do a weight loss group on Facebook, what effect might that have on people who are not participating in our intervention, but who are friends with or, or following on a different platform? Uh, people who are participating in the intervention. It's possible that we may kind of inadvertently, if we're not careful, scrape data that come from not our participant. And so being really aware of how the data are going to be pulled out and how they're going to be coded, who that's going to affect, making sure that's communicated to potential participants. Of course, all of this has a lot to do with informed consent procedures. So one of the things that has come up a lot in the research that I do is making sure that we're really as researchers on top of the privacy settings for the tools that we might use. So for something like Facebook, um, for Twitter, for any social media platform, for a lot of the apps that we could be using, it's our responsibility as researchers to understand all of the stuff that people usually just scroll right by and agree to uh, when they download an app or first start using a social media platform. It's our responsibility to understand that and communicate the potential risks to participants. This also has a lot to do with how the IRB thinks about our research. One of the wonderful things about the CORE initiative is that it's helped facilitate this conversation between researchers and IRB members and ethical boards more generally about what are the actual risks? What are the unique risks with digital health work? And where are there risks that are really no more than if this person just downloaded the app or started using the social media platform on their own? So there's an opportunity to do some education there that early career researchers may not see themselves as quite yet qualified to do, but they can really be part of that conversation. And of course, there's always the issue of data security. So we're, we're aware of several news stories that have come out recently. Facebook just recently had another data breach. MyFitnessPal recently had a data breach that exposed millions of users, some of them uh, possibly research participants, to th their data being accessed by people who are not authorized. 
I bring up Facebook in my fitness pal because these are two tools that I've used in the past. And so one of the things that ends up happening in this situation is we all take a step back and reflect on how should our research practices move forward with this new information and how do we continue to and increase the protections that we provide for our research participants. IRBs can certainly go too far. And I know Camille has done some work to try to assess in what situations does this tend to happen and how can we overcome some of that with more conversation and how can we kind of standardize some of these procedures. Again, ultimately, it's our responsibility as researchers to understand what the risks are and effectively communicate that to participants. But as an early career researcher, that can seem incredibly daunting because say you're trained to, and I'll use myself as an example, say you're trained as a psychologist, you started out doing you know, depression and chronic illness or something like that. You don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of Facebook, even if that's something you uh, thought from the beginning that you wanted to use, especially if you're coming to this later, that's not necessarily something that you've thought about. But it is our responsibility. And if we don't know, maybe we should be enlisting the help of mentors or peers or experts outside of our particular field to try to get that knowledge so that we're doing the best we can by our participants, which ultimately is going to have um, the best effect on our research. So the remainder of the paper that I mentioned that's going to be coming out in the Journal of Behavioral Medicine talks about the future and some of these ethical challenges. In this paper, we focus specifically on three uh, technologies, social media, smartphone applications, and wearable tech, so like fitness bands. We don't, just for the sake of um, scope and length, um, we did not talk about any of the other technologies that you see here that come with their own ethical challenges and their own challenges just logistically to implement and their own science behind them. There are probably many more that I'm, I'm not referring to. Uh, again, this was more to um, hone and be specific in the scope so that it wouldn't get too unwieldy, but we certainly recognize that it's critically important for researchers to be thinking not just about uh, how best we can use these technologies, but also what some of the ethical implications are. So what else is going on for early career researchers in addition to struggling with learning how to do work ethically and then moving that into the digital space potentially? When we're first starting out with ideas about maybe wanting to use digital tools, which we probably have great reasons for, they can increase the reach and effectiveness of our work. They can get to people um, where they are. They can reach uh, underserved populations. They can be easier to use than a variety of other methods. One kind of basic question is, are we going to use one tool? Or are we going to use more than one? Are they going to be integrated? Or are they going to have to be used separately? Which ones are we going to use and why? Which users are we going to target? Do we think that the general population of adults or children might be interested in this? Or is this going to be tailored to the needs of a particular population? And why? For psychologists, we often focus on which processes or theories are we trying to invoke or harness when we're using digital tools. So a lot of digital tools are really capitalizing on some of the same processes that would happen face-to-face, -face, but how... Are they different in a digital space? And what do we need to know before we can optimize those? A big one for me and a lot of people I've talked to is this space is really saturated at this point. So it's wonderful that so many people are realizing the potential of digital health. But even beyond the research space, we also have uh, commercial enterprises where the value of this industry is now, I think, $8 billion just this year. So how can we possibly make a dent and actually innovate in this space if we're just starting out? What kinds of ideas are actually going to be useful and valued in this space to move the field forward? In order to do that kind of work, what training do I need and where might I get it? And then a huge one for a lot of early career researchers is how am I going to pay for this? Digital health work can be incredibly expensive if you're developing technology yourself or if you're um, trying to engage experts uh, from industry, which is something that if we're moving more toward that kind of collaboration. How are we going to pay those individuals? Because usually they don't do their work for free. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking a little bit about how I've tried to or kind of stumbled into, as I mentioned, addressing three questions. So which processes or theories, what kind of training do I need and where do I get it? And how can I fund new work 
in these areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about using your particular specialization, teaming up with others, and then searching for grants that would fund not just your research, but also ongoing training opportunities. Now, caveat, uh, everything I'm going to say is going to sound easy because I've done it. I can say like, whoa, you need to do this and it'll be more successful for you. I've been incredibly fortunate and this isn't something that is easy to do. Even if you're really lucky, it's not something that's easy to do. Uh, but again, I'm mentioning these things that I sort of stumbled into because I think a lot of early career researchers could be more intentional about planning to do these things and actually have um, more efficient, better, earlier outcomes than I had. So an example of which processes or theories and how that might uh, be helpful or innovative in the digital space is my particular specialty is in how people use information from the social environment to inform their health decisions. So this can happen really quickly um, and automatically, sometimes implicitly, you're not even aware that it's happening, or it can be deliberate, well thought out, and well considered. But here we're using a theory that comes from social psychology. So this process is called social comparison. We're using this theory that many have argued is its own field at this point because there is so much to know about how this process works. What's happening in the digital space that I've noticed, a lot of um, mobile apps and other websites are offering people the opportunity to make social comparisons and using that as a potential mechanism of behavior change. They're trying to facilitate behavior change by using social comparison without considering all of the nuances and all of the evidence and theory that has been developed over the last 60 years. So I'll give you an example. A lot of my work lately is in physical activity. So a lot of physical activity apps will give you the opportunity to learn about how you're doing with your physical activity in relation to other users of that app. So this is an example from Fitbit. This was a private group. A group of people got together and said, we want to be able to send messages to each other. That's what you see on the bottom. And we also in that space are going to be able to see how we're doing in the last month relative to everyone else. So this is displaying uh, from ranked from highest to lowest how many steps you've taken this month. And this is coming directly from your Fitbit. So for, for those of you listening, imagine that you're in second place. That could be really satisfying and you could be really motivated to get into first place at some point and that could actually motivate you to take more steps. Maybe you're having a bad day and it would have been really great to see yourself in first place and you're feeling crappy now because you're not winning at whatever this competition is. Now imagine that you're in last place and imagine that you're in last place for three weeks in a row. Is that going to be motivating for a lot of people or is that going to be discouraging? And does it matter again what kind of mood you're in, what kind of day you had, how you're interpreting that information? The answer is yes. We know that from social comparison theory. It seems like a lot of these apps are considering that sometimes this information is not motivating and that changes over time. So recently, we uh, wrote a short viewpoint piece in the journal M Health, uh, basically taking this issue to task and saying we could be doing so much better by tailoring the social comparison environment and experience for individual users and adapting that over time. Uh, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about that or reading that paper, if you're following me on Twitter, or if, or if you just look back at my timeline, you should see a link to that um, around this time. In addition to doing some of this work on my own, because it is really hard to change the way people think about or bring new ideas into this space, um, writing one paper is not going to do it. Teaming up with other people to try to answer this question has been, I've been incredibly fortunate to uh, have collaborators recommend me to new colleagues. So one of the things that we've been able to do recently is really think about how social comparison functions in a group exer game. So in a competition environment where teams are competing with each other to achieve steps, how is social comparison going to be beneficial? How could it be harmful? And how can we actually optimize? How can we measure and then optimize the social comparison environment for individual users? This, we were able to get NSF funding for this. So this is, again, an example of trying to find some funding. 
Um, but I was brought into this question rather than this being an original question that I wanted to ask. In terms of what kind of training do I need and where do I get it? Uh, I mentioned that one of the things we're seeing in the digital health space is that there's a lot more uh, uh, communication between industry and academia, and there is so much more need for that. Academia and industry bring different strengths to the table and also different areas of opportunity. Facilitating this communication is critically important, and especially for someone who's coming from academia, we speak such a different language from people in industry. And so even if we were going to hire, say, a team of programmers to develop a new app, we need to learn how to communicate our ideas to them in a way that they're going to understand what it is that we're saying. So part of the training that needs to happen for a lot of early career researchers is figuring out how to translate what you're saying into commercial and industry speak. With the last couple of minutes, I'll talk a bit about how I was able to get this kind of training and fund this kind of training, as well as research activities in this area by going after an NIHK award. So these are not easy to get, um, but they do provide three to five years of funding for research and training activities that will help junior researchers get to the next level where they have preliminary data and the knowledge and expertise in order to uh, be qualified to have their own R01, the big grants um, that fund uh, randomized clinical trials often. So the goal of my K award, um, there are two specific aims toward the same goal. We're going to use ecological momentary assessment methods to, uh, to determine what effect social comparisons have on midlife women's physical activity in the natural environment, as well as some other experiences. We're going to use that information to build a mobile health app that is tailored to their needs and, again, optimizes the social comparison environment for them. And I've been asked many, many questions by our, pro our lead programmer, uh, who is also a mentor on this grant. So the whole idea is to learn as you go. Uh, I've been asked many times, you know, what do you think you want this app to look like? And I don't really have any idea yet. Um, so her putting things on the table for me and being able to say, here's the information I'm going to need from you at X point in time, that gives me an opportunity to go back and learn that information and have a more productive conversation with her later. So it's embedding training and research opportunities in the same funding source. I can't say enough positive things about this mechanism. Again, they're not easy to get. It's not a matter of just going out and getting one, but really thinking through early on, what are the opportunities? Where do I want my career to go? And what kind of training and research would I need in order to get to that next level with my goals? That's really what a K award is for. So I'll stop there and say thank you again to everyone who's here today. Um, thank you again to Camille and to the CORE Initiative for having me. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Danny Arrigo. Um, you can also follow SBM Digital Health for the Society of Behavioral Medicine. And our research team is Rowan Chase Lab on Twitter. Thanks. Annie, thank you so much. That was just a terrific overview of your work. And it's so interesting to hear about what you're doing and, and how you've made navigated working with different teams and working with industry and seeking funding and, and finding them, um, you know, just basically putting, putting a research lab together, just is really exciting. So I have, um, I have a couple questions, but we have one question in our Q and a from Megan Jackson, who was asking about insights into the optimal length of the consent process. And so I'm curious, since you've been deploying, um, your research, I think you've been deploying interventions via uh, Facebook, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But how are you going about informed consent? Is it in person? Is it the traditional paper? Is, are you using mobile technologies to, um, to achieve informed consent? And what do you see as some of the critical challenges in that area? So the challenge here, is, the biggest challenge I see is that informed consent should really be a process. It should be a conversation. It should be an opportunity for potential participants to ask questions, get their questions answered, and understand that they can continue to ask questions. So we really emphasize all of that, whether we're doing this on paper or we're doing it face-to-face. -face. 
I usually prefer for this to be a test so that I can get a sense of the nonverbal cues that would tell me when someone does or doesn't understand or if I should explain it differently. It's very easy, as we all know, with um, privacy or, or user agreements to see a block of text and just say, yeah, 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 sure, that sounds fine. Um, so if I have the opportunity, and uh, I think it, it, it's not going to take away from the research process, I will do the consent process face-to-face. I'll try to make it efficient. So no more than 10 minutes, uh, if it's possible to explain what people need to know to consent. But I will remind them always that this is not your only opportunity to ask questions. You can withdraw at any time. And you know, if you ever want to revisit what we talked about, all you have to do is reach out to me at you know this contact information. So I, I think... It is a challenge if you're trying to do your work entirely remotely to ensure that participants have a good sense of what they need to know to participate. But it's also what are the risks to them if they participate without really reading the consent form thoroughly. Maybe if you're using Facebook, their data will not be private, but you can get around that maybe with having them use a separate account or use an ID number or not give their identifying information. Oh, that, that's really helpful. Something else that you were talking about um, that I really resonated with is how much you're, you're really taking responsibility for making sure you're doing this research ethically and not outsourcing or relying to a greater extent on IRBs. And as, as you and I have discussed before, yeah. <laughs> IRBs are, often are not prepared for this kind of work. And so it's putting the researcher in a responsibility of educating IRBs, but also doing their due diligence to make sure they're not increasing risk that they may not have even known about, like like maybe, you know, the, the terms and conditions of use may not be in the favor of the participants. So coding or, or giving them a different way of accessing that account is, is one tip. But the other thing that you've mentioned is is how interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and you know, introducing industry and academic relationships. And so we're all coming at this from different socializations around ethics yeah. and different vocabularies and different, um, just different training. And so what have you identified as some key successes and how to navigate those relationships? Because they're critical, but we're really, they're really challenging, at least from my experience. So I, I think really I, as early as possible, and I've limited experience with this, but it's something we talk about a lot, um, especially when we do kind of early career forums with the Society of Behavioral Medicine. This is something that a lot of early career people are really hungry for because they understand that that's where the field is going. And so certainly for mentors who maybe don't have any experience in this space, what can they do to be helpful when maybe their trainee is going off in a direction that they're... they're are just not prepared for. Um, get early as you can in the process trying to engage people as partners. Of course, you want your research to reflect your ideas and you you want, um, if you're coming from the research background, you want the science to be as strong and, and as valid as possible. But making sure that people have the sense that their ideas are being heard, that they're true partners in the research has worked really well. Um, that we, you could say the same thing for if you're a primary investigator and you're trying to work with a statistician. Um, often we go to statisticians to say, like, can you do X for me? Rather than, can you help me figure out what X should be? And the same thing applies with, um, in my case, it would be our, our programmers. Um, asking them not to do the work for me, not to tell me what they think it should look like, but what are the kinds of things that you need me to know? And if you were going to do something like this, what would you want to consider? I love the the idea of of participants as partners, and that's really been gaining some steam over the last you know couple years about what does that look like and what does it mean. And when you were talking about how the the app developer wanted you to tell them what you want this to look like, I, I immediately went to, well, you know, you're going to really have to do some formative research with your your end right. users to figure out what that's yeah. going to look like. And I think that's such a critical part of of having you know digital health be a success. And it's really great to hear that that you've been you know at the forefront of making that happen. So, um, thank you so much for for joining us today. It was a fabulous presentation. We will keep um, just a few reminders because we need to wrap up. 
Uh, if you're not signed up for the Connected and Open Research Ethics Network, um, please do that by visiting the core.ucsd.edu. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email with details to register. Um, we will make the core webinar available at our website, and that would be the core.ucsd.edu slash webinars. And Danny had mentioned to me, or probably, I think it was actually on Twitter, Danny was using the core webinars to satisfy some responsible conduct of research training, which hadn't been our intention, but it's great to know that, that's, uh, that these webinars are a source of education and ongoing training for people. One of the things that I really want to leave everyone in the audience with is that we can't keep the core moving forward without the membership and, and our network. And right now we have over 600 researchers, IRB members, regulators, legal scholars, technologists that are part of this community. And we thrive because we're helping each other out in this space. So if you have any IRB approved consent forms or research protocols that you would like to share on our resource library, please email them to the core at eng.ucsd.edu. And we can help you upload those or work with you to get some of that content up so that it can help people who haven't had as much experience as those of us that may have gone through the IRB process already. To have you involved, our next webinar is going to be in November when we are featuring John Ayers and a, and a group of co-authors who uh, just published a paper in Nature Digital Medicine that focuses on not quoting, uh, not directly quoting tweets. It's called Don't Quote Me, um, and talking about the ethical challenges of, of using publicly available tweets and research. So thank you, and we'll see you all in November.